Rick is a physical therapist in the Netherlands who is doing research to determine if adding heel elevation to Harlequin step, ATG split squat, and ATG squat causes any changes in VMO activation. So the goal of this video is to explain the results that he got from his initial study, discuss his plans for future projects, and what this means for the future of physical rehabilitation. So I'm going to be sharing a great deal of background information from Brian Ziegler, another physical therapist who has written extensively on Medium, for training, physical therapy, and a variety of other concepts, I highly recommend you check out his account for more. So the VMO is a tear-shaped muscle on the inside of your thigh that acts to straighten and stabilize your knee by means of its oblique fiber orientation. Now there's evidence and clues in the literature showing that the VMO can protect against cartilage damage, and reduces knee replacement risk by buffering forces on the knee from everyday life, walking, running, jumping, and it sort of makes sense. You have more capability in a muscle designed to decrease instability at a joint you can expect there to be less issues internally as a result of buffering those forces externally. From the athletic truth through standpoint, we advocate for the Patrick step, ATG split squat, and full range ATG squat for increasing pain-free knee ability. And we make the claim that it's the reason for the thousands of wins that you see through our social media platforms. Specifically, we claim that the more knee over toe ability that you get, the greater demand and subsequent adaptation on the VMO as a result. Research has shown the deep squat position you do get preferential activation of the VMO compared to the lateral quad muscle. Honestly, it is quite hard to find a lot of research studies that have direct VMO activation in the methods. For whatever reason, it just isn't being looked at as extensively as it should. Rick goes on to explain in his research study that training programs for pain at the kneecap, aka patellofemoral pain syndrome, are currently not standardized and are actually very diverse. In my own searching for literature on the VMO, it's hard to find any consistency on the subject. But as for exercise, every program on those research studies usually has something along the lines of basic hip or knee strengthening exercises. With the common observation in these research studies being that patients with patellofemoral pain syndrome, the VMO, that's vastus medialis oblique muscle, is often weak. Connecting both of these two points, one, the general ambiguity of exercises currently in the literature for the knee joint, and two, the common knowledge that the VMO muscle is weak with patellofemoral pain syndrome, coupled with the fact that Rick has been an observer for years of the ATG system's extensive results for members on the program who have solved their knee issues, led Rick to want to determine via research what we know on the ATG team via practice. So Rick got a group of 20 people to participate in a randomized crossover design. This is just a study where the participants receive the same two options of the treatment. In this case, it's Patrick step, which is a step down with the foot flat on the surface, ATG split squat compared to a traditional rear foot elevated split squat, forces the front leg to get full range of motion in the bottom position, as well as a full range squat. All of these motions being measured for VMO activation without and with heel elevation for those three subsequent movements. Difference in results were measured from the Wilcoxon signed rank test. That's a big fancy term that took me a long time to figure out what it meant. I had to look at a bunch of different sources to figure out exactly how to explain this. So please bear with me. Essentially, this test uses ranked data. And in this case, it will be VMO activation measured in microvolts from EMG measurement. How do you determine the results of this test? First, you lay out your hypothesis. Hypothesis is? Hypothesi? I don't know, but there's two of them. One, there is no difference in VMO activation in the Patrick step, ATG split squat, and VMO squat when using heel elevation. That's your null. Alternate hypothesis. There is a difference in VMO activation in the Patrick step, ATG split squat, and VMO squat when using heel elevation. Depending on what we find from the study results will determine which one of these hypotheses, hypothesi, we can reject. From the data, we then calculate the differences in each individual's results. So say for example, and this is a very arbitrary example because I'm not really well versed in uh, EMG microvolts. Say someone had, without heel elevation, 50 microvolts of VMO activation with this movement. If that person got 100 microvolts in EMG activation, of the VMO, then what you would do, subtract and it will give you a positive value, which is reflective of gaining VMO activation. If you lost VMO activation, you would do the same thing and assign it a negative value. After that, you calculate the sums of all the negative values from each participant and all the positive values, giving you two values. All those negative values are called W minus, all those positive values are called W plus. And as an aside, I want to know what you have to do to get something named after yourself. I want something called the Ken test or you know, the Walters, Walters Wombo. But you would then take your official test statistic W as the smallest of the W minus and the W plus measures. Whichever one smallest is the one you're going to use to determine significance in this test. Finally, you use a fancy reference table to see what your critical value of W will be. 
The critical value is your smoking gun. It determines whether or not your results in the study are due to chance. So let's say the W minus is your lowest of your sums compared to W plus, which in Rick's study, that was the case. In this case, when you add all of those sums together, that means there existed less instances of VMO decreases in activation compared to the instances of VMO activation when you use heel elevation on those big three exercises. You then compare that value, that W minus instances of VMO decrease to the smoking gun value to determine if those results had a likelihood of being due to chance. If your value is less than that critical value, then you can reject the first hypothesis and say that there is a difference in VMO activation. And the amount of your value statistically referred to as P determines the percentage of your conviction. The P value times 100 determines the percentage chance that your results, if repeated, would lead to no difference in VMO activation. The lower the chance, the more reproducible the results and the greater strength of your study. Okay, that was a lot of information fire hosed at you at once. But if you can understand what I'm about to say right now, then I did my job. If not, shoot me a DM or comment below and I'll try to explain further. In Rick's study, here are the findings. We're adding heel elevation to the ATG squat. There was a significantly better activation of the VMO muscle. If repeated, you'd only have a 3.5% chance of it not activating your VMO better. Put more simply, a 96.5 chance of increasing VMO activation if this exact study was repeated. We're adding heel elevation on the ATG split squat. There is a significantly better activation of the VMO. And if repeated, you'd have only a 1.5% chance of it not activating your VMO better. A 98.5% chance of increasing VMO activation when performing the ATG split squat with heel elevation. And finally, adding heel elevation to the Patrick step, otherwise known as on the ATG programs, the Poliquin step, there was significantly better activation of the VMO, and if repeated, you'd have only a 0.5% chance of it not activating better. A 99.5% chance of increasing VMO activation when performing a step down with heel elevation. So these are very promising results within this group of subjects. Now, Rick emphasized the need to determine if this outcome is indicative of a larger population with future studies of larger size, because the greater population size, the larger the effect is meaning. The absolute conclusion is that adding a heel raise did in fact elicit greater activation in the VMO by increasing motor units per EMG study in the ATG split squat, Patrick step, and ATG squat in this group of 20 people. There currently isn't an objective minimally important change for getting EMG activation as measured per microvolts, meaning we don't know how high of an increase in EMG you need to get objective changes in strength, pain, or function. But this is known at large with any EMG studies because it's just the nature of the beast. We do know that the more EMG that you have, the greater motor unit activation as a general rule. More heel elevation equals greater VMO motor unit activation. That's the fact. The art then becomes your application in practice to this truth. Common sense says that you can get even more motor unit activation by increasing the demand of the exercise with more weight, more reps, and more height. You can also increase the challenge of the loading by taking control of the tempo, making sure that you can control every ounce of working range so that the VMO is forced to stabilize at slight knee flexion, mid knee flexion, and full knee flexion. You can even take these exercises to failure to increase the motor unit demand on the VMO muscle because again, the research that we currently know shows that there's preferential activation of the VMO in the deep squat position over the vastus lateralis, which would be more of a challenge compared to the 10 reps that Rick used in his study. The average muscle activity increased by 14% in the ATG squat, 8.81% in the ATG split squat, and a whopping 21% in the Patrick step with the implementation of the heel wedge. And by Rick's application, this would be a clinically relevant basis for implementing these motions in clinical practice, as well as programming for patellofemoral pain syndrome clients, especially if they have VMO weaknesses. The beauty of it is the low cost of implementation for physical therapists. You can use something as simple as a doorstop or a bumper plate, or something as bougie as these ATG buddies. And it's also a tool that's multi-purpose. For example, in Rick's study, he mentioned that for ACL reconstructions, a common issue is VMO atrophy, meaning the VMO muscle decreases in size following the surgery. So knowing that this increases potential for VMO activation makes it a worthwhile tool to use for this patient population. Rick explains that in the future, research should be performed to more strictly adhere to the form cues of these movements, keeping the depth the same for each participant, doing more exercises, 
as well as utilizing a larger research population to increase the strength of the study, as I mentioned before. Another thought was then to include measurements for treatment effects of this increased VMO activity, such as measuring range of motion, strength, coordination stability, and even pain. Rick's conclusion, VMO activation was higher in the ATG split squat, ATG squat, and Patrick step movement patterns when using heel elevation, offering possibilities for improving exercise programs for people with patellofemoral pain syndrome. I'm very excited for Rick. I think he's on the forefront of something very special in the field of research. His next big study, determining the biomechanical and physiological effects of the reverse treadmill with the goal of improving lower extremity function among different age groups. If he's indeed able to find scientific basis for what we at ATG already recognize anecdotally, this has the potential to change the framework of how we handle knee issues as a physical therapy profession. What are my thoughts? If you haven't checked out my new about section in my YouTube channel that explains my research bias on any study, here you go. I'm going to outline it very clearly. This is my bias. One, the author's opinion, mine included, does not have the final say as to what is true. Two, the current existing evidence points to but does not dictate what is true. Three, when considering the human body, the said principle, specific adaptation to impose demand, is the proper lens to interpret points one, the author's opinion, and my opinion, and points two, the current evidence pointing to what's true. So, in this study, the absolute fact, VMO activation when using a heel wedge in the ATG split squat, Patrick step, and ATG squat, increased. Author's opinion, exercise programs can be improved for patellofemoral pain who have weak VMOs by using the heel wedge in their exercises. My opinion, the ATG program has already accomplished extensive results in VMO activation through progressive overload of ATG squat, ATG split squat, and poliquin step as evidenced by the thousands of knee success stories over the years. Current evidence, the VMO can be preferentially trained depending on the angle of loading. And finally, said principle to interpret all of the above. The VMO needs to stabilize the kneecap when you place the knee in a position, angle, or exercise that forces it to demonstrate stabilization, all of the components of the area and around the VMO will adapt accordingly. The joint itself, the peripheral nervous system, the central nervous system's processing will all improve long-term, specifically to the extent of the imposed demand given sufficient rest and recovery. Therefore, any knees over toe position will increase VMO ability. The more knees over toes that you get with a heel wedge means more VMO demand, more VMO adaptation long term.